proteins, the, the DNA is transcribed to make RNA. And then the RNA is now translated to make protein. So the proteins are the working pieces of the machinery of the cells that make your cells work. Um, the genes, the genes, and the DNA code for these proteins. We have about 20,000 genes. I'll talk a little more about that. There's about 20,000 different genes, uh, protein coding genes. So you have about 20,000 genes in the genome. Um, you know, just for example, to help sort of bring this, you know, genes like uh, myosin that make your muscles contract, right? They make the protein that makes your muscles contract. Even lower that we think about that transport oxygen throughout our blood. Um, the CSTR, this is a transporter that uh, your lungs can transport uh, uh, potassium, and this is, this is what is detected in cystic fibrosis. So what do you accept this is in your brain, right? This is just an example of the genes. So I can give you one list of 20,000, right? Um, so maybe with this information, we can think a little bit about how you could have two different cell types from the same DNA, right? Think about a neuron. It's pretty different from a blood cell, right? This is sort of picture of a new cell in your blood. Um, you know, this is just a schematic. Let's say the genes are like light bulbs. Um, in your the neuron, there's going to be some set of genes that are on, others that are off. And uh, you might expect to see a neurotransmitter too that's on in your neuron, right? And it's making protein, right? The other genes aren't making protein in their silos. Um, and this is why, you know, this is a neuron. In contrast, you look at blood cell, they have same genes, right? Same genes, but they turn off and on different ones, right? Now they're turning off this neurotransmitter, but they're turning on some other gene that just making an antibody that your immune cells need to go around and fight off pathogens, right? So this is just a very simple picture here. Um, and actually, this concept is not so new. It was actually intuited, uh, I guess, 60-something years ago by Conrad Waddington. This is actually before we really knew about the DNA or pro how this coded proteins. Um, but Conrad Waddington sort of coined this concept of epigenetic landscape or epigenesis, where Conrad really reasoned that, well, you know, at the beginning there's a cell, and through the process of development, this cell sitting at the top of some hierarchy will kind of move down these sort of energy, sort of energy minimum, think about a ball rolling down a hill, and um, give rise to the different cell types in the organism. And this turns out to be this is certainly accurate for something that was hypothesized in 1949. And, you know, this is sort of another picture of that. But now we realize that, you know, these cells at the top of one of the landscape are these pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells that, you know, haven't decided their fate, their, their options are open. Um, these cells, through the process of, of development, and Conrad Wagner called this epigenesis, uh, sort of over development will uh, turn on and off different genes and ultimately sort of fix those states, um, whether they be sort of mesoderm or endoderm, different types of cells. And I kind of show this at the bottom just to tell you this is the diversity, right? And this is sort of a concept that sort of is with the heart of the field of epigenetics as we begin to think about how, you know, again, one genome can give rise to so many different cells. Um, at this time, we didn't really understand how the genes were coded, we didn't know DNA, but now that we've learned, I mean, if you get a lot more information, we get to understand how is it possible that this orchestration of events can proceed. Uh, that's on the human genome, right? So what is in our, what is in our genome? This is, uh, this is kind of a fun picture because this is our director, Eric Lander, and Kim Watson there, who's uh, Watson and Craig, of course, who figured out the double helix. And this is Francis Collins, who's the director of DNA now, and thank you, Bob Waterston, who was a visionary in this process. Now, and Seattle published the human genome project in about 2003. So the sequence for three billion bases, this is what is in the human genome, it's three billion letters of sequence. Um, and what is it? Pretty, you look at this, it's pretty hard to interpret this book. But, um, you know, it wasn't so hard to look for sequences that look like they could code for a protein, because especially the, the DNA can be triplets, and you know what the triplets are in the DNA that will lead to certain code for certain amino acids, code for certain types of proteins. So you can actually go through this draft of the human genome, and you can find the genes. And I think people were betting a lot at the time. Eric tells me that there was this whole betting pool where, you know, uh, some people thought there were, you know, 15,000 genes, but some people thought the human was triplets, they must have more genes, and, you know, the, the, the numbers went up, something about 130,000 genes. Um, but in the end, the answer was kind of boring. The answer was, in this three billion bases of DNA, there's only about 20,000 protein coding genes. It's not that much more than in a fly or a roundworm. Um, but here's, I think, one of the most striking observations here, and that's that, that those genes, those protein coding genes, account for just one or two percent of the DNA sequence. So, you know, what is the other 99%? And, um, you know, to me, that was one of the most compelling and interesting questions that, that came out here. Um, and, you know, people thought, this is our matter or something, I'll, I'll revisit some of these terms that we've evolved our understanding. Um, but this is a really interesting question. If you think about DNA and purpose, it's make a genome, make a protein, and you realize that only 1% of your genome does that. So, um, so I'll give you some more information on why that's probably important and how one might get to it that there's something more than the genes. And it comes actually from genetics. So I'm going back to genetics for a little bit. And, um, you know, what causes disease? And we know of, uh, you know, here's your, your, your sequence of your genes, and there are diseases caused by mutations in the genes, and there's quite a few of them. Um, they're called, often called monogenic diseases because they're, there's an inheritance pattern, it's pretty simple, simple inheritance, or dominant or recessive. Um, one gene is involved, like here's an example, so cystic fibrosis, I already mentioned, it's a mutation in the transporter, um, and that's what causes cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. There's sickle cell anemia, as an example, that's a hemoglobin mutation. Uh, the shame must be logistic. I can give you a bunch of examples. Not that, there's, a, there's a fair number of examples. Um, you know, eye color is kind of a monogenic trait where you inherit it, and it's one, it's one gene, it's a little more complicated, but it's not so much more complicated. So this is great, but there's a problem. This is the minority of cases, the vast majority of diseases that are burdened on society that we think about. Don't fit this, don't fit this uh, simple model. Uh, rather, they're complex, even this complex human diseases, and it's not one mutation, but there are you know, scores or hundreds of different mutations that are somewhat common in the, uh, in the population. Look, if they combine in the wrong ways, we don't really understand exactly which ways they combine, you end up with disease. And the examples are you know, diabetes. This is a complex disease. It's not one mutation, it's many that contribute to this. Schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and I could go on and on. And we think of these as, you, know, sort of, uh, you might say, polygenic or complex diseases. So the other picture I showed you, where it's just a gene that's a little simple, there's 